So I told a little story about the user in the app and three-legged OAuth, and now I want to get into the nuts and bolts. And remember, what the user wants to do is wants to grant permission to the app. So say I'm Michael Bissell, because I am, but I'm the, I'm the owner of the app, and I've got Betty Lou, who wants to use the app. Betty Lou needs to be able to log into jokeindex.com in order to let the Michael Bissell app post comments and do other things on behalf of Betty Lou. So first thing that has to happen is that the user initiates this by saying to the app, I want you to log into my account. And the app goes to the API and says, where can this user log in? Now this is done by sending in a request to api.jokeindex.com to authenticate the client ID, to make sure this app is actually allowed to even consume Joke Index, the, the Joke Index API. Provided everything's okay, then that will generate a response, 302, which then gets passed on to the user. And at this point, the user is going to stop talking to the app and start talking directly with jokeindex.com. Notice it's jokeindex.com now, not API. We're now going to go to the website because this is a different user interface, a different user experience than the Michael Bissell app. This is the Joke Index website. Now the way we do this programmatically in Apigee is the authentication flow is really straightforward. There's a verify API key policy and then I have a raise 302. It's a raise fault policy, but we're not really raising a fault. We're just changing the response. If we look at the verify API key policy first, you'll see that all I'm doing is looking at the query parameter for client ID. You can make it a header. You can do a form parameter. The OAuth spec actually says to send it as a query parameter. Um, so we're, we're defaulting to that. It also says client ID, which the uh, Apigee UI as of this moment says uh, defaults that to API key. So for compliance, you might want to change that to client ID like I have in this example. Now the 302, what this does is it rewrites the location. It creates a status code 302, which tells the user's web browser to go look at jokeindex.com users slash index and then passes along that client ID. So we verified that the client ID was okay. If that app key wasn't working, we would have thrown an error and we wouldn't have gotten to this step. But we go ahead and use that key and pass it along so that when the user lands on this login page at jokeindex.com, we know which app we're talking about. Now the login side is completely obscure now. We're no longer on the app. We're now on joke index so the app doesn't get to see the login details the scopes are granted so things like can i post comments can i rate jokes this lets the user add a level of granularity saying the kinds of services that i'm going to allow this particular app to do with my joke index account so then the login service not the app not the user but the web page that you're, that you're using to do your login, that login service at that point generates a code with that client ID and then sends that user back to the app's callback URL, which is part of the Apigee OAuth flow. So when they signed up to get their API key, that app developer at michaelbissell.com created a callback URL of michaelbissell.com slash callback. So let's go through the steps of generating a code. So once the whatever identification system has happened and the, and the login system recognizes that you're a valid user, that's when we get that page that says, these are the scopes. Do you want to do comments? Do you want to do ratings? Things like that. So you can confirm those. And then once you confirm those, that's where we go and mint the code for this app. Now, www.jokeindex.com is talking to api.jokeindex.com to generate a code. And that code comes back with that callback URL. We do this with just one policy. The 
OAuth2 policy again, and the function in here is the generate authorization code. Now notice we have attributes in here for things like username. So I could actually pass along a query parameter for username so that when the app comes in with this code and generates an access token, we will be able to identify what user this code actually belongs to. That's good for other headers and other information that you may need to, to carry around. So once we send that back to the user, the user goes back to the app's website. So in this case, I'm going to go back to michaelbissell.com slash callback with the scopes that, that were allowed and with that code that says generate an access token. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and generate an access token now with a code. So the user gets this redirect URL back from the login page. So Betty Lou gets this from www.chokeindex.com and goes to michaelbissell.com slash callback. So michaelbissell.com then takes that code, that E3AB that you see there, and passes that along to api.chokeindex.com. Now we're just doing standard token generation. This is just like we did in, in, in Apogee Learn where we did um, client credentials grants or password grants. We're doing another kind of grant here. And then once that grant is completed, you get the codes back. So here it is. It's I have two policies here. Um, the fault no post is just because I require you to use post to to use this. So if you actually hit that second step, it's because you didn't use post and I want to kick you back with a with an error. But the generate access token policy is pretty straightforward. You'll notice that in the supported grant types, we've now added authorization code. So authorization underscore code is the type of grant that we're going to send. We're going to send these as form parameters. And the reason we're sending them as form parameters is because the OAuth spec generally recommends that and it keeps things secure. So things like usernames and passwords that might be sent in a password grant should be sent as form parameters, um, any other information. Um, examples on Apogee.com generally say query param. Strongly recommend you use form parameters in, in this case. But you'll notice that there's still in the payload that comes back when we grant that access token, there's a username. Now, it went to my default value of no name because when I did the code grant, I added attributes. So we inherit these attributes from the original code grant. And then those will show up and be available in the flow. So when I come back and verify this API key against Apigee, it's going to inherit those variables. And I will actually have a special variable called username that's going to be available to my flows for whatever I want to use it for. So to sum up, and take it away from my cute little love story. Remember, there's user, app, API, and a login service. The user accesses the app. The app then uses the OAuth authentication, comes back with a 302 redirect, which it passes along to the user. The user then goes directly to the HTTP connection on a website to talk to that login server. All the authentication for credentialing is handled by the login server, not by the API or by the app, but directly between the user and the login server. And then finally, a form is sent back from the login server to confirm the permissions that the user wants to grant to that app, and of course, that that app is allowed to do that. Once that's been approved, the login server generates a code using OAuth slash code, using a special service for that gets a 302 redirect callback URL, which it passes back to the user. The user then follows that and accesses the app, which then is given the code and is able to use the generate token policy to get an access token, which comes back by default as a JSON payload. So I hope that helps make OAuth a little bit more sensible. It is a very complicated flow, and uh, I assume that people will continue to have problems and, um, with different permutations because everybody's implementation can be a little different depending on your identity services and all your security requirements. So let us know what other questions you might have about that. Thanks.